Hello, I'm Sami Zaydan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, the cost of brokering Brexit. We'll look at the state of the UK economy as it heads into a new year and uncertain times. Also this week, a major milestone for the internet. Half the global population is now online. But what about the other half? Plus, an underwater economy, a report from the world's most diverse coral reefs in Kenya. Well, the UK economy is slowing and its currency is falling. This was the week which was supposed to deliver a deal on Brexit. But it ended with a vote of confidence in British Prime Minister Theresa May. Now, although she survived, there are question marks over her next steps. Neve Barker reports from Ramsgate in the UK about growing concern over what next year might bring. It is a time of great upheaval for Britain. The people of Kent in southeast England voted overwhelmingly to leave the EU. Many here hoped Brexit would be the dawn of a new era, but they remain in limbo. And everyone's just disgusted with the government at the moment. So I think that's the biggest thing, because there's no answers as they yet. I think a lot of people that have voted for leave perhaps wouldn't if they knew it was going to be this fast that it's turning into. A bit of a circus, really. You have a message for the Prime Minister? Go. It's time. You've had your time, sadly. Behind the scenes, the local council is preparing for the worst. It's produced this document, a contingency plan to avoid being potentially crippled by the effects of Brexit. In the event of a no deal, there's likely to be major disruptions to border and customs arrangements, causing huge disruptions across Kent and beyond. Probably 80%, 90% of all the roll-on, roll-off uh, ferries uh, and trains uh, come out of Kent. So if there is disruption, the impact on the Kent economy is really severe with the roads getting blocked and clogged by having to hold and park 12,000 lorries at any one time. In 2015, a strike by French ferry workers led to kilometres of congestion. The report warns that Brexit could lead to an even worse situation, affecting not just the delivery of goods, but also the collection of rubbish, children going to school, the registration of births and deaths, and even the transfer of bodies to mortuaries. Some of the plans on paper are already being realised. The government spent $7 million keeping this disused airport available as a potential lorry park for thousands of stranded drivers. And this is the nearby port of Ramsgate, serving mainly pleasure craft and the occasional freighter. It's been earmarked as a possible overspill for the major cross-channel ferry port of Dover. In order to keep the county and the country moving, these plans need to be watertight. Historically, the county of Kent made its fortune by trading with Europe and the rest of the world, by keeping its doors open. In more recent years, the county forged even deeper ties with the European Union through the Eurotunnel. Trade and travel Depends, of course, upon speed and ease. But post-Brexit, there are absolutely no guarantees at all about what could be on the horizon next. Britain's economy has slowed since the 2016 Brexit referendum. The Centre for European Reform suggests the government's austerity drive would be on the way to completion had Britain voted to stay in the European Union. The most recent budget spelled out a lack of spending on things like policing and education. This week, sterling reached its lowest level since April 2017 against the US dollar. A weaker currency means the price of goods is likely to rise. That's likely to hit household spending. Well, joining me now from London is Peter Dixon. Peter is a senior economist with Commerce Bank. Good to have you with us. So, Peter... To what extent has Brexit been an expensive miscalculation so far? What do economists say? Um, I think that's a, a very good way of putting it, really. Um, I mean, I think when you look back uh, two, three years ago, uh, those people who pushed for Brexit, I don't think, expected to win, and they clearly never had a plan to deliver in the event that they did. So now we've wasted an awful lot of time and effort since the referendum trying to figure out how to deliver a Brexit, which it's not even clear that the electorate now wants. 
So it has indeed been very expensive, both in terms of absorbing government time and uh, the, the, the energy which businesses now have to spend in order to, to prepare for something which, frankly, may not even yet happen. How expensive, though? How much does it cost the UK economy? Do we, can we put a number on it? Broadly speaking, GDP is about two percentage points below uh, where it would otherwise have been in the absence of Brexit, and that can be calculated in a, in a number of ways. I mean, that's a bit like saying we've, you know, we've almost lost a year's growth um, over a, over a two-year period, which is, you know, quite a quite a considerable uh, quite a considerable sum. Um, so, without putting a precise figure on it, uh, I think it's fair to say the number's big. There's been a lot of volatility in the pound. Who's making money from it, though, Peter? Well, I think anybody who is uh, short sterling or was short sterling at the start of the week, uh, pretty, you know, has, has done okay. But, um, I mean, I don't think many people really benefit from a weaker pound, certainly not here in the UK. Uh, it gives um, exporters a bit of a lift in terms of the fact that they can book wider profit margins. But that's a short-term gain because ultimately um, they, they were unable to repeat that unless they're able to, to boost exports in future. So generally speaking, as I said, only people shorting the pound, investors shorting the pound, are going to win out of this. Uh, but the, the longer-term costs are, are, are generally going to be borne by the British electorate. And I rather suspect that the, those costs will be far higher than the gains that any speculators might make. So ultimately, what does that mean for economic growth in 2019 looking ahead, do you think? Well, I think on the, on the, current, uh, on the current projections, on the assumption that we don't get a hard Brexit, you know, growth will continue to remain in the area of 1.5%, you know, give or take a little bit. Obviously, at the start of the year, if we get continued uncertainty, then that could lead to maybe a bit more weakness in um, investment growth, uh, consumption would, of course, be impacted by uh, the strength of inflation, if there is indeed any, as a result of the, of the weakening pound. So at the start of the year, I rather suspect we'll get off to a slow start, but on the assumption that um, some of this Brexit uncertainty uh, is um, eliminated or smoothed away, then over the course of the year, I rather hope, and, and I think the consensus expects too, that growth next year will be similar to what we've seen this year. You mentioned the hard Brexit there. What would that cost the UK economy? Well, it's hard to say exactly, but I mean, the scenario analysis you've seen from the Bank of England, from the government and indeed my own calculations suggest that it could be uh, of the order of, you know, 8% of GDP over a five year horizon, say. Uh, most of that would be front loaded, I guess, into the first few quarters uh, after the hard Brexit. So uh, you would probably see quite a sharp contraction in economic output in the second quarter of, of next year with you know, possibly lingering ongoing effects in the third. And it will take time, I think, for uh, businesses and indeed governments and consumers to adjust to this new environment. So it could be you know, quite, a, quite a dramatic environment. Um, you know, my own guess is, is that if there is a hard Brexit, it will be such a nasty experience that uh, it will very, very quickly be reversed in subsequent quarters. But nonetheless, you know, I think that over the course of uh, a sort of two year horizon, even under those circumstances, uh, the best you could hope for is um, you know, a growth rate of around 1%, which is you know, significantly lower than we have become used to. Is the uncertainty, though, already diminishing the attractiveness of the UK as a destination for business and investment? Um, yes, I think that's probably true. I mean, we've seen indications that uh, companies are beginning to think about shifting their operations out of the UK. Uh, we're seeing signs that companies are postponing their investment um, so, yes, clearly the, uh, the numbers do indicate that there, there are some marginal impacts. It's not particularly noticeable, I don't think, at the macro level just yet, but really, you know, based on the anecdotal evidence that's happening. But when it comes to the financial sector in particular, um, we certainly are seeing indications that companies are much more circumspect about expanding their London operations, and they're in the process of uh, transferring people out of London to other European destinations in order to ensure business continuity uh, after March of next year. So irrespective of whether there's a hard Brexit, soft Brexit or no Brexit, it's already had an impact on the financial services industry. Thanks so much, Peter. We'll end it on that note. Thanks for your thoughts on that. All right, thank you very much. Still to come on Counting the Cost, how Cuba is trying to ensure no one citizen can accumulate too much wealth. But first, the head of India's central bank handed in his resignation this week. 
He cited personal reasons for leaving his job halfway through his term. Analysts say his replacement, Shakti Kanta Das, will have to work to reassure markets about the credibility of the institution he leads. That's because the government is reportedly putting pressure on the central bank to loosen the purse strings. All of that ahead of next year's general election. Global investors had a message for governments this week. Some of the world's biggest pension funds, insurers and asset managers say it's time for fossil fuel subsidies to end. They maintain that if they don't, the world faces a financial crash several times worse than the 2008 crisis. Denmark is considering laws which would require food manufacturers and supermarkets to label products with a rating of their impact on the environment. Floor Lonsbach reports. In this supermarket, the label on the potatoes or sausages that you're about to buy will soon be able to tell you exactly how much damage it's done to the planet. In an attempt to reduce its carbon emissions and slow down climate change, the Danish government wants to introduce a new rating label for food products. Consumers are very um, concerned about the climate change and uh, if, you, if you look at this, you'll get with, with the climate labeling on, we'll get, the consumer will get information, okay, and they want to make a change, they want to do something for the world, and then they can say, okay, I'll buy this product because it's more climate friendly. When it comes to their carbon footprints, not all products are made the same. Some require a lot of land and water resources, while other products had to be transported for hundreds of kilometers by planes or by ships in order to get here, adding to pollution levels. Agriculture is one of the major contributors to the level of carbon emissions that's driving climate change worldwide. Denmark is building wind farms, promoting energy efficiency and getting rid of fossil fueled cars and also wants to reduce pollution caused by the food industry in order to have zero emissions by the year 2050. But developing a label that calculates all that won't be an easy task. Some say it will be a waste of valuable time. It's going to be very complicated as we look, look uh, on this label. Our, our fear is that the consumers will be maybe even more confused because now you'll have another label on top of all the other labels that exist. And really I think we need to act now. Uh, we know what has to be done. We, we need to eat less meat. A label system will not save the planet. <laughs> But radically changing our eating habits will, says this insect farmer. Teaching the next generation to cook with larvae and worms instead of meat, he says, is far more effective. Uh, so insects are the answer because they pollute a hundred times less than beef does, for instance. And uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that uh, children know this because basically they are the inhabitants of the world uh, of the future. <laughs> While most seem to agree, there isn't much time left to bring global warming closer to the forefront of people's minds. Solutions on how to feed the world in the future without destroying it vary and some <laughs> might take a bit of courage. An underwater economy lies off the coast of Kenya. It's crucial for fish reproduction and protecting shorelines from tropical storms and, of course, tourism. Malcolm Webb reports now from one of the world's most diverse coral reefs. Every morning, Kalume Kahindi sets out to sea to catch fish. Thousands of people here on Kenya's coast do the same. Some days he'll make a hundred dollars, some days nothing. You work for yourself and you sell it as you choose. You sell to women and they make their own money. It's benefiting everyone in this community. The fish he catches depend on nearby coral reefs to reproduce. We went to have a look. Yeah, yeah I can go. The world's most diverse ecosystems are found here. And they're under threat because of climate change. Corals are a little bit like tiny upside down jellyfish. When the sea temperature rises, it stresses them, a bit like a fever in a human being, 
and it causes them to spit out tiny microbes that they depend on for their survival. Then they turn white and they start to die. It looks like this. It's called bleaching and it's already happened to about half the world's coral. Global warming causes oceanic heat waves. Our dive instructor, Franco, witnessed one of the worst. Ten years ago, the corals were really dead, but now they're developing slowly. It's only some, they are lip breaching. The coral here made a remarkable recovery that time. But scientists say the heat waves are becoming more frequent and more intense. What we'll see is more and more coral bleaching events, which means more and more coral death and mortality. And, and if we don't change course, we could lose up to 90% of the world's coral, live coral, um, within the next uh, few decades. They support the incomes of 500 million people through tourism and fishing. Kalume is among them. He doesn't make a lot of money. And if the coral goes, his livelihood goes too. It's an internet milestone. More than half the world's population is now connected to the internet. The UN agency, the International Telecommunication Union, estimates 3.9 billion people, over 51% of the global population, will gain access by year's end. At current growth rates, we won't approach 100% global internet adoption for well over two decades. The inventor of the World Wide Web, Tim Berners-Lee, says the internet is broken. He's not alone. There's growing concern mega companies like Google have too much power over our digital lives. Google CEO Sundar Pichai testified this week before the US House Judiciary Committee. He had to answer questions about how the world's biggest search engine tracks people's location and uses our private data. One of the projects he's involved in is the secretive Project Dragonfly. It's a project designed to bring a censored search engine to China. He spoke about what user information Google would share with the Chinese authorities. There are times in the past we have uh, debated the conditions uh, to operate and, and we explore a wide range of possibilities. Currently it is an effort uh, only internally for us. That we, we are not doing this in China and so, you know, uh, but I'm happy to consult back and uh, be transparent to the extent we plan something there. Well, joining me now from London is Frederica Koltheuna. Frederica leads Privacy International's Data Exploitation Program. Good to have you with us. So, looking at the controversy over Google's Dragonfly project, how big of an issue is digital encroachment of human rights, if I can uh, coin that term? How big of a problem is that becoming? It's a huge problem. I think the, the main lesson of 2018 has been that the current status is not just unsustainable, but also quite dangerous uh, from a human rights perspective. Well, is the digital economy then heading towards more regulation if self-regulation has failed? There is a growing consensus that self-regulation has failed epically, and I think that's a very good thing. We're seeing regulatory developments, not just in the EU, where uh, the general data protection has entered into force, one of the strongest data protection laws in the world, but we're also seeing regulatory developments in other parts of the world, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Kenya, in India, in Pakistan, in California. So that just shows that there is an interest to regulate. That said, uh, mass surveillance by government is still uh, a problem that hasn't been solved. And we're also seeing governments, on the one hand authoritarian governments, but also right-wing populists uh, around the world who embrace this new criticism of big technology uh, companies to uh, promote a very different agenda that's not quite compatible with human rights. So what else can consumers do to protect themselves then? Our position is always that the individual is, is the weakest link in the chain and you should be protected by design and by default. Something that we have done this year, regulation is one thing and enforcement is something completely different. We have recently filed complaints against seven companies in the data broker, advertising technology and uh, credit scoring industry because we found that uh, their practices raise a lot of questions, especially in light of their new obligations under European laws. There are things that you can do to protect yourself, but it will never be enough. And that, that just shows that the problem is much more systemic and that we need better laws and protections, but also strong enforcement. Part of the problem is that there's too few companies making too much money and wielding too much power over the Internet. How do you fix that? 
it's quite interesting to observe that competition authorities are now starting to look at data and the role that data plays in competition and in the market. And the, the realization seems to be that uh, we are seeing behavior by companies that, that, that suggests that they're quite dominant in their respective markets. We're now in a situation, looking globally, where half the world's population is online and half isn't. It's almost exactly 50-50 split. Why? It's a quite an achievement that half the world's population is online. And it's important to say that a lot of these people, especially new internet users, aren't actually accessing the free and open internet. Uh, in lots of places, there's government censorship. But also, lots of new internet users aren't able to afford services outside of very closely walled corporate gardens, like Facebook products, such as Facebook Zero. Um, so while inclusion and internet access for more people is, is tremendously important, the price of this cannot be uh, that these people don't, act, uh, don't actually access the entire full internet. Well, what is the real world implications of such a divide? Between those who are connected and those who are not. That's one. And the other that you mentioned, those who are really not connected in a free way on the internet. Companies like Facebook and Google would like us to believe that they are the internet. And the sad truth is that in many parts of the world, that is the case. And I think that's a problem because the vision, the original vision of the internet uh, is that of connecting, is of sharing and spreading ideas freely. And that remains an, an, an important and exciting idea. And uh, if people aren't really having access to free information, this, this vision cannot be realized. Concerns have been raised over digital addiction, especially young children. Is enough being done to counter that, do you think? The core of the issue, I think, is that companies like Google and Facebook always love to say that they don't sell data. The truth is they are selling access to your attention. Uh, so by tackling the way in which data is being used in these industries, we're also tackling the way in which our attention is being sold. Thanks so much for your thoughts. Thank you very much. And finally, our Latin America editor, Lucia Newman, reports from Havana now, where the government is trying to rein in the private sector. The owner of this Havana apartment rents rooms to tourists. Mm -hmm. Just when new and highly unpopular restrictions on Cuba's fledgling private sector were about to go into effect last week, authorities surprised everyone. They had forbidden families from having more than one license. But now they've lifted the limit so that, for example, we can also sell handicrafts or food. In another unusual response to public pressure, plans to limit private restaurants to only 50 chairs were also scrapped. 13% of the workforce has moved over to the private sector, many of them professionals who've abandoned their jobs in state-run enterprises, like mechanical engineer Hirzel Silva. Claro que hubiera... I would have preferred to earn half or a quarter of what I earn here as a cashier just to stay in my profession, which I love. But I couldn't earn even a fraction of that or to support my family working for the state. The dominant state sector is struggling to keep employees, which may help explain attempts to limit small privately run businesses. The very fact that there are categories, specific categories in which people can start their own businesses mean that you cannot do or you cannot start a business in every area, in any area of the economy, in every sector. New demands and restrictions have been placed even on private taxis, despite the acute shortage of public transportation. Unlike Vietnam and China, the Communist Party here still views the private sector with suspicion for many reasons, including ideological, social, and geopolitical. Cuban government leaders are afraid that a growing and increasingly sophisticated private sector will help advance the U.S. government's anti-communist agenda here. In fact, both President Barack Obama and now President Donald Trump have repeatedly said that they want to help and encourage the private sector because they view it as an engine for political change here. But the decision to backtrack on plans to reduce the private sector even further seems to be recognition that, like it or not, Cuba's struggling economy needs it. And that's our show for this week. But remember, you can get in touch with us via Twitter. Use the hashtag AJCTC when you do, or drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. There's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. 
That's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Sami Zaydan. From the whole team, thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. <laughs>